So let's begin. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We've got a couple of terrific guests on a topic that is vital to all of us, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. We've been talking about teaching and higher education since the forum launched in 2016. We've approached it from a whole bunch of different angles. What's exciting to me about this week's guests is that they've been researching how to improve university and college teaching. They've been doing this for years. They have a website called Structural Moves and a new book uh, from Harvard Education Press on the subject. Uh, they both have a whole stream of ideas based on a lot of research and a lot of practice. And so I'd like to put them up so that we can learn from them how we can improve college university teaching. So to begin with, let me bring one of them, Professor Myra Levinson, up on stage. Professor Levinson, hello. Hi, thanks for having me. And just as a reminder, it's Mira. Think Mira, Mira on the wall. <laughs> I keep I keep doing that. There's, there's right. so you know there's so many spellings. My my mother-in-law was Moira. So I, I, I keep, yeah. So well, Mira, Mira on the wall. We, well, the way we ask people to introduce themselves in the forum is to describe what they're working on for the next year. So I'm, I'm curious, what projects are top of mind for you? And also, what uh, what ideas? What are you thinking about for the next year? All right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about three, but each really briefly. Um, one is I noticed actually in the chat, there was a question about whether or not you were working on, uh, you're planning a forum coming up on AI in education. So one of the things actually that I'm involved in is a committee at the Harvard Graduate School of education on AI and education and AI and learning. And so that is something that I'm thinking a lot about this year, as I think many of us are, um, and thinking about how it might transform or not our classrooms, our work as teachers, and I think most importantly to me, society and how anticipated transformations of society might impact our own work as educators. Um, Second, uh, this has obviously been a really um, uh, hard semester in terms of um, things happening in the world that, uh, you know, find expression on our campuses. And in some ways, I really celebrate how much people are involved in following what's going on in the world and speaking about it, and yet also speaking about it uh, in ways that feel productive across lines of difference has felt really hard. So that's something that I'm working on. Um, uh, Quite specifically, uh, I direct a design studio on civics and ethics pedagogy here at Harvard, and so we're going mm. to try to lean in to support work on this. Um, and that's related to the third thing that I'm working on and thinking about this year, which is I'm a political theorist by training. Um, and mm. so one of the things that I've been trying to do for some years now is to start a field of educational ethics modeled after mm -hmm. bioethics. Um, that like bioethics would be informed by questions of policy and practice and help to inform questions of policy and practice and develop theory that can be helpful there. And one of the dimensions of educational ethics is how we think about what we um, permit, forbid, and celebrate in our classrooms and on our campuses uh, from students, from faculty, from visitors, from staff, et cetera. And so that's also top of mind. Wow. Wow. That is a lot of great stuff. So uh, first of all, AI, of course, we support that. We've uh, we've had a whole series of sessions on AI in the forum. We have more coming up in, a, in the chat. I threw in my sub stack, which I commend to your, uh, uh, to your call. Oh, great. Thank you. We, we and, share resources, so I will grab it. And, and I just came out of a meeting where people were talking about how to fund civics education. Um, and so th this is definitely a subject that's a great deal of interest. And your ethics project, we're going to bring you back. Just I'm just telling you this. We're going to bring you back hey. just for the ethics idea. Um, that is, you know, assuming your your president lasts the week. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not gonna, that's it's it's the Penn president that got more in trouble. I think. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. But hang hang on one second. Let me uh, let me bring up your co-author, Mira, and uh, and let's see if we can find out what he is up to. Now, Jeremy is also going to uh, prove this this terrible rule we have that it really helps to have a beard to be on the future transform. So just just to let you know, just to warn you, this is what's happening here. Hello, Jeremy. Hi. Thank you for having us. Oh, it's great to see you. It's great to see you. Where, where have we found you today? 
I am at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester. And, and uh, sorry, did you ask where I am or what I'm up to? Well, first, where you are. Okay, that's that is where I am. I'm in my office uh, up on the hill here. Um, I, I will kind of follow Mira and talk about three things uh, most relevant to me today. Uh, I'm continuing to uh, move through and make sense of and analyze a whole bo a whole lot of data that I collected during the during pandemic schooling uh, and beyond. Um, and uh, so so in in my research, I look at uh, secondary teachers responses to instructional change and disruption um, and so i'm continuing to look at uh, through a few different studies how teachers responded to the transition to remote schooling and out of remote schooling how it impacted their relationships with students and with each other um, so that's some some research that i'm continuing to do and work on right now um, at the college level i am involved in the um, creation and design right now of a teaching and learning center um, wow. that is really focused on inclusive excellence in teaching um, and part of a broader initiative of the college. There was once a teaching and learning center, but it was really just kind of a one person mm -hmm. operation. And we're looking to really kind of more meaningfully uh, stitch this work into the fabric of the institution. And so it's been really exciting to be part of that work. Um, and then most personally, uh, I am looking forward to being on leave next semester to spend it with my six month old baby. Um, right. And uh, so that's that's the most immediate and, and kind of joyous uh, thing for me in my life. Six months old. I, I, I've got to say, you look pretty good for a parent with a six month old. I appreciate that. Uh, she is she is now sleeping through the night. So I think uh, if you saw me a week ago, I might not. <laughs> <laughs> that makes all the difference. That's, yes. that's, Very that's important. the best thing until they turn 21, I think. That's just amazing. <laughs> well, well, welcome, welcome. And uh, I'm glad for all these projects. Um, in fact, uh, um, there's a new book on teaching and learning centers. It just came out from Johns Hopkins, um, which I'm, I'm hoping to get to. And hopefully we can bring the, bring the author on the program. Great. Well, let me let me bring you all up on stage equally here, um, so that we can uh, we can be together. And friends, if you're new to the forum, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask our, our very kind guests a couple of questions about their work, um, and then they will probably cut loose and and describe all kinds of great stuff. But then it's going to I'm going to turn the microphone over to you. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts and your questions. Uh, so please, as you uh, listen to uh, our guests. Think about the questions you have, and they may be based on your own work, your own experience, they may be based on your own curiosity. Um, but the forum is here for you. Uh, like Soil and Green, the forum is made out of people. Um, so the, the, the first question I wanted to ask was, and both of you are educators, uh, and, you know, and, and Mira, you've, you've been working in, in higher education for an even longer period of time. I'm curious, what were some of the findings in your research that surprised you the most? You're looking at how to improve teaching in higher education. What was the most unusual or surprising finding you came up with? That's a really interesting question. Um, let me give myself uh, a few seconds to think about that by filling the space, uh, by talking, by like <laughs> just giving a little background, because I actually think that that might be helpful for uh, reflecting on the surprise. So, yeah, I, I had this like weird uh, career trajectory. I did my doctorate in political theory right after undergrad. And then I became a middle school teacher for eight years in the Atlanta and the Boston public schools. And eventually I wended my way back, uh, actually when my daughter was around the same age as Jeremy's daughter, um, to wow. academia, because it was a lot easier being a professor than being an uh, eighth grade teacher. And so this instructional moves project in many ways came out of um, my frustration and eventually Jeremy's and my frustration, I think, about the ways in which um, uh, in higher education, uh, including at Harvard, um, there was not, it did not feel as if there was the same level of dispersed knowledge about powerful teaching practices and the conception that you could actually learn them, right? Like, I mean, that you know, in yeah. higher education, there was this sense um, that it was, uh, that people who were powerful teachers were often really charismatic, 
right? Mm -hmm. Or they just knew how to do it. Um, and or that it didn't matter, right? Like that wasn't your real job. Um, and or that we didn't know very much. And so like, you know, uh, it was time to go investigate. And I thought, wait, we know a ton about what good teaching looks like and how to foster, you know, learning across lines of difference and for diverse learners. It's and so this this instructional moves initiative really was in many ways to help higher ed, uh, at least like research universities like we're at at Harvard, right? That, that's right. different from right. many places that um, uh, higher ed institutions that have been focused on um, uh, on powerful teaching and learning for a long time, uh, uh, recognize and then start to implement um, high quality teaching practices that in ways therefore were not so surprising. But I think finally, that's given me enough time to think of the answer to your question, um, which is uh, I think I was delighted to see and learn from the number of different ways that teaching practices show up in different disciplinary spaces. So in instructional moves, we went into classrooms in um, neuroscientists and lawyers and uh, medical educators and um, and people who were teaching, you know, negotiations and political theory and history, and to see familiar instructional moves, but enacted in these very different disciplinary spaces, that was a, a, a joy and a learning experience for me. Mm. Well, it sounds great. It sounds great. I, mean, I just want to you know, make sure that we all hear that one of those important takeaways, that this is something which we don't support enough in, in higher education, that we don't have that kind of access to fine teaching tactics. Um, and thank you for your background. That's a wonderful background to have that uh, K through 12, as well as the higher education one. Jeremy, uh, Mira has, has teed you up very nicely. Um, so now, now is your chance to say, what, what was a surprising finding for you? Yeah, so I, I think um, just to build on Mira's background, I, I too come from a K-12 background. Um, and I, you know, before I pursued my doctorate at the uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education, um, I was a middle and high school English teacher. Um, and that's, that's very core to my identity as a researcher, as a scholar. And uh, I kind of, I think, found instructional moves at the right time at kind of a moment of, of existential crisis in, in when, I, when I was pursuing education research because I felt so distanced from the complexities of the classroom. Um, and I think perhaps Mira noticed this and invited me into the project, which, you know, I was on for the duration of my doctorate. Um, so, so that's a little background about me and, and how I found this work. And I really wasn't uh, for that reason, very familiar uh, with post-secondary teaching. You know, my wheelhouse is very much secondary teaching. Um, mm. I think that it's interesting, and, and I think that, uh, you know, several of our instructors have um, reflected on this, is the fact that what's happening at the K-12 level, it takes a long time for it to get up to the post-secondary level and that we often have, you know, there, there isn't necessarily this vocabulary of teaching at that level either, but there's more of one than there would be at the post-secondary level. Um, I think one, one surprising finding for me was the fact that first, that so few of the people that we looked at had explicit training in, in pedagogy and instruction. Mm. Right. And, and mm. I think if you're in the academy, if you're in higher ed, that's not a surprise to you. It certainly yeah. was a surprise to me as somebody, you know, that, that spent a great deal of time doing pedagogical training. But uh, on that note, I mean, their reflections suggested that relatively small interventions in training could be enormously effective. Right. And that... Uh, folks had really kind of, the, the people that we highlight have gone out of their way to kind of create communities of practice with instructors where they talk about instruction, where they exchange practices. And that was really valuable. But we have one instructor that we feature, Dan Levy, who talks about how when he was a doctoral student at Northwestern, he, he literally just had one hour of explicit training in pedagogy. 
Uh, that hour was from Ken Bain, so a good person to spend your hour with. But he said, you know, uh, just in that one hour, that was a memorable and important hour that that things that he learned there would likely be rudimentary to K-12 teachers, but they were revolutionary for um, for him as a post-secondary instructor. Mm. And this, this suggests mm. to me both that there is a great need for more training and more opportunities for pedagogical development among post-secondary instructors, but also that like, you know, relatively small changes can make can make a great big difference in um, in post-secondary teaching and then therefore by extension in student learning. Well, this is this is depressing and uh, and, and and very, very good to know. Um, I'm curious, in, in higher education, we often speak about the powers of active learning, and we've had several scholars and practitioners of that, um, you know, here on the forum. And is is that, is not that active learning is one single thing, but it, is active learning a good bundle of, of uh, pedagogies in, in your estimation? Sorry, is that a question for me or for Jeremy? That's for either of you. Go for well, it, Jeremy. Well, Jeremy, go first. So I think absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, that you know, in education, we we love our buzzwords, and so I think it's important to actually know what we mean when we say active learning, right? I see, and we describe active learning in the book as um, creating occasions for students to authentically apply what they have learned, um, and in mm -hmm. so doing, mm -hmm. they learn to see their discipline not as this string of disconnected facts that they need to memorize but rather um, an organized body of knowledge that they have some ownership and some stake in, right? And they become, they think like experts. And I think that, you know, again, looking at this from the K-12 uh, perspective as well, that it's an uphill battle everywhere, but I think that it's especially so in the post-secondary setting. Um, one of those, one of the reasons for that is is training. And I think another thing that we don't, you know, necessarily talk about enough is the fact that um, some students come into our classrooms kind of expecting uh, passive instruction, right? And expecting a traditional teacher-centered mm. environment for mm. a number of reasons. And mm. one of the reasons is that they've been kind of long socialized into that um, landscape over many years. Um, another is that they're like, paying for access to the best minds in the field. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't necessarily want to hear their peer talk, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there can be kind of some subtle or not so subtle resistance from high achieving students to these sorts of pedagogies. And it's one of the reasons that a lot of folks don't do it. They're afraid of getting poor evaluations or they try something initially and it doesn't work out and therefore they, they abandon it and, and, and retreat to the podium. Um, so I think like the stakes are high, but it's it's a two way street as well, right? That that we have that that the the work of teaching and learning are completely intertwined when we think about active learning, and I think we focus a lot on on the the inadequacy of the of the instructor, and maybe we also need to think about the student too on the receiving end, and the and the very understandable and rational reasons perhaps why a student would resist that kind of instruction in the classroom. Yeah, there's a, we learned uh, as we we're doing this research, uh, we have a colleague here in the physics and actually uh, who had done research um, on uh, the same course uh, taught um, to different sections, one in lecture form and one in more uh, sort of uh, project oriented and, you know, collaborative sort of flipped classroom. Form. And um, the students very consistently predicted, uh, felt that they were learning less in this in the project oriented active learning course, and consistently did better on the assessments. Um, uh, right, but um, but they were really anxious about it. They really were quite sure that they were learning less because they could point to you know just less material that was being transmitted. Right, and so um, it. It, part of the, what's interesting about this is that in higher education, you know, we do value research and there is very good research, in fact, about learning. Um, and we know a lot about what fosters learning. But um, outside of, say, education schools, many universities do not actually systematically research 
what promotes learning in their own classrooms, um, right? And so we use various proxies that are terrible uh, to say evaluate each other's teaching, like grade distributions, right? And it's the fact that English departments on average give more A or that students earn more A's than in you know the physics department. Does that show that they're actually learning less because it's gotten easy? Does that show us more because yeah. actually it's a sign of yeah. mastery, right? Like we use these terrible proxies. We actually do have good research that shows that when students are engaged in active meaning making, when they are the ones having to do the work in the classroom, that is when they are learning. They're not do when they're not doing the work in the classroom, when the educators are doing the work in the classroom and the students are sitting back, unsurprisingly, they are, you know, gaining fewer skills, developing less knowledge, more, less likely to develop the dispositions of the discipline or the field or the profession, whatever it is that we're trying to teach. Um, but it is very hard because we've been socialized at all levels to believe that certain yeah. things look like learning and usually the very dense um, content uh, transmission. Mm -hmm. did, uh, did Mira's audio just break up for anybody else? Not for me. Okay, okay, so it may have been in my head. I'm sorry, Mira. Um, uh, That's okay. Uh, I, I missed the last sentence, but if everybody else got it, uh, so, great, so uh, I was just saying that we tend to mistake, uh, we, we've been socialized to think that um, high levels of learning are uh, measurable by high levels of dense content transmission. Mm -hmm. Very good. I, I don't mean that's a great thing. I mean, very good. That right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I, I have more questions, but but I want to make sure everyone else gets to ask uh, their own questions. Um, and if uh, friends, if 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 I'm having any, uh, if I get garbled or uh, blurred, please let me know in the chat. Uh, we have a bunch of questions that come up, and these are kind of clarifying and 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 I think in many ways fundamental questions. Here's one from our good friend John Hollenbeck up in um, in Madison, uh, and he asks, why do we conduct such deep research on teaching and so little research on learning? I do not think they're the same thing. So there's a huge area, in fact, in education research uh, called learning sciences. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, I mean, there's cognitive science, there's learning sciences, there's uh, research within developmental psychology. Like it's scattered in a lot of different places. There is a lot of research on learning. Um, and it is true, there is also research on teaching and sometimes those really come together um, and there's research on teaching and learning um, sort of unified. And it's true, it's, it is that sweet spot that um, seems uh, really uh, important. Um, and in some ways, I wouldn't say, like I, I would say in some ways instructional moves, um, this book that Jeremy and I wrote together and our web and the website instructional moves, um, uh, tries to take the research on teaching and the research on learning and do that sort of magical synthesis in part through richly described um, sort of miniature portraits of mm -hmm. classrooms, of teachers, of students, like really working and wrestling together and sort of then deep diving into some of those particular practices because it's right, a teaching move um, is powerful only if it's deployed at the right time in the right way with you know in response to the learner you know needs or is seeking or can engage with in order to promote the learning um and uh what somebody needs or wants to learn may also shape what teaching move you deploy right it's, it's like there are general pedagogical moves um and right. then this, um, and there's content knowledge, and then there's this magical thing in the middle that's pedagogical content knowledge. It's not just like generally, do you know how to use wait time, or generally, do you know how to bring in a nervous student into discussion, but say in your own field, do you know how to help people master a difficult concept? Say, you know, if you are a historian, how do you help people understand historical causation? Right, and it's probably not just a flow chart with arrows. Whereas to understand, say, a certain form of scientific causation, 
it may be that getting people to like think about a flow chart is really powerful, but those are two different kinds of pedagogical content knowledge. How do you teach historical causation in a way that's really meaningful versus say, how do you teach scientific causation? Yeah. Uh, and that also, I think, is about blending teaching and learning. Yeah, very good. And just in case people missed this, when you said wait time, that's uh, uh, teachers learning how to wait after they've asked a question for students to respond. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That used to be a problem for me when I started teaching in my um, late 20s, in part because I was drinking so much coffee. Uh, <laughs> it's been 0. 0.5 seconds. Why don't you answer? You know. <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, to, to be disciplined and not weigh in immediately or, or not yeah. to call yeah. on the first person that raises their hand is, is can be a struggle yeah. for sure. But I think to, to add on to what Mira was saying there, I mean, I think, you know, there's an old saying, I, I taught it, but they didn't learn it. Mm -hmm. Right. We say that a lot in, in, in education. And I think that, well, if, if they didn't learn it, I don't think you necessarily taught it. Right. These things are intimately connected. Uh, and I think on on the note of pedagogical content knowledge, I, you know, there's a lot of interesting examples in the book where the um, where where the what really informs the how. Where, like, I think a great example of this is Aliyah El Amin's classroom, which we feature in our virtual learning classroom. She teaches a course called Emancipatory Inquiry, and it's very mm. much about disrupting traditional research paradigms, introducing students to, to different kinds of research, uh, youth participatory ac action research, autoethnography, these different forms of research. Um, and, and she does that, and a great example from her classroom is what she calls the teach-in where uh, each day um, uh, a student will open class, a different student will, will close class by teaching the class uh, for 10 minutes something that they know or that knows them. It's, it's a simple hmm. prompt. Um, hmm. But it's this kind of way to both build community in the classroom while uplifting different forms of knowledge by calling into question what counts as valid knowledge. Hmm. Um, and it's this beautiful moment where the um, where the, the content of the course is kind of folded into how the course is taught and the pedagogical kind of um, preoccupations of the course. Oh, so I don't know if there's quite a word for what I'm describing there. I think it's kind of like, you know, we talk about in literature, like the marriage of form and function. I think something mm -hmm. similar is happening there. I don't know if there's a name for it, um, yeah. but okay. I... I you could create such a name. We could coin. We could coin a term for that. And sure. then your new teaching and learning center will be the home of it. <laughs> uh, we we have we have more questions coming in. I want to make sure that uh, everyone gets a chance to ask. Uh, and here a couple of quick questions from our uh, our friend Glenn. Um, and this is uh, uh, what is lecturing interactively? I, I think he's responding to a phrase that you used, and um, just want some clarification on that. Sure, I, I'll, I'll start. So, um, uh, so and it might be helpful to know that I use that phrase because that is the title of one of the chapters of the book. So uh, the book um, uh, it basically talks about create, how instructors create a classroom, an inclusive classroom culture for learning, about lecturing interactively, about facilitating discussion, uh, a few forms of uh, sort of a, problem-based uh, education, teaching with cases, teaching with simulations, and then online teaching, uh, teaching in digital space. And the, um, initially, when we were working on instructional moves, we were going to leave lecturing out altogether because, um, you know, monodirectional information transfer is in fact not information transfer. It can make you feel really good. Like, you know, in those few minutes, you feel really great. Wow, I know all this stuff. But, you know, next week, you don't know very much at all. Um, mm -hmm. But when we went around to our colleagues in the learning centers, uh, both around Harvard and more broadly nationwide, they were like, oh my gosh, like the it's like way the two ways that the university professors teach is lecturing and discussion. So if you're not going to help us with that, you're not helping us, right? Like let's start where people are. So we thought, okay, well we're not, we can't try to teach people how merely to lecture well, because lecturing is not teaching, but interactive lecturing is teaching because 
interactive lecturing is when you are having the students interact with the content, with the skills, with each other, potentially with the professor, with the world, right? And there are lots of different ways that you can uh, have students do that even in the context of a lecture. So Jeremy, do you wanna talk about some of those in part because I think we may have lost Brian for a minute. <laughs> Oh, uh, did I did I disappear or did I stall out? You did, but I just queued Jeremy up to give some examples of that. I, I heard that. I, I, oh, great. I, <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that. Um, Thank you. Uh, the 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 instructors that we feature in the lecturing interactive chapter, I think, are notable for how sparing they how sparing their lecturing is. Um, I think they've really kind of taken the research on this to heart. That. Mm -hmm. um, that if you're not giving students occasions to really grapple, process, and think about what you are offering in the lecture, um, then there's kind of an illusion of learning that's taking place. And I think, you know, hearkening back to the earlier study that Mira mentioned, um, the students that were in the, the traditional lecture class thought that they had actually learned more than those in the active learning class. And part of that is because they're kind of witnessing charisma on stage from the from the instructor, right? And so um, the instructors that we feature are offering occasions to turn to a neighbor and discuss what they've learned so far. They incorporate live polling into their classrooms to spur further discussion, um, to gauge and, and check for understanding, to um, kind of locate misconceptions um, and, and determine what needs reteaching. Um, they offer moments of silent reflection. Uh, and um, so, so it's not just kind of one, like Mira said, monodirectional exposition from, from the instructor. Um, so I think that that's like a, a big shift that, that has to happen in a lot of classrooms. And as one of our, uh, one of the um, instructors that we feature talked about, part of it is like a fear of giving up control on the side of the instructor that mm -hmm. that if if i hand over some some control of this to students there's going to be total chaos um and and that is often not the case and i think that uh we we kind of have this belief that we need to we need to stand up there and explain and explain and explain but um it might be that by by lecturing more sparingly, by offering these occasions for application, that students are better able to access and take up lectures when we do them for shorter periods than they would be in a lengthier kind of format. Um, so that's really kind of what's what's at the heart of, of that chapter. Uh, but again, again, I think that it's important that the folks that we feature there, I think that some of them were even a little like, you know, I'm, I'm not a lecturer. Why are you, why are you featuring me in this chapter, right? Um, right? Because they really don't identify with that modality, but they haven't necessarily cast it aside altogether because there are benefits to it. I think we just need to limit how long we spend at the podium. podium. And, and the one thing I'd love to add is that I do think that many of these examples are things that people who do identify as lecturers can uh, try out without it's being too high stakes for them, right? Mm -hmm. So if what you say is, all right, you've probably chunked your lectures anyway. Like you think, all right, first I'm covering X concept and now I'm going to cover Y concept and then I'm going to show an application of this and why this matters in our field or something. Okay, at the end of X con concept, either you know put a question on the slide and have students turn and talk to each other or you could like ask a question and have a multiple choice poll that they answer with their phones or whatever and you see did they get it or you might have them do a problem individually or together and then discuss it for like three minutes and now you get to go on and, and lecture about why concept you're not losing a ton of time it's a little like it, it's a it's small enough and defined enough that a faculty member can try it out. And then ideally they'll think, oh my gosh, like I am suddenly understanding why I have to reteach this thing, you know, next week. Yeah. Or, oh my gosh, my students are getting it after all. Or they asked me this great question that leads us in, you know, whatever. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. That's such a great feeling. And and that and that should be a feeling that we want to achieve. 
right? And, and return to. Mm -hmm. uh, we have more questions coming in. And friends, again, if, if you're new to the form or you're new to Shindig, then on the bottom of the screen is a white strip with the different buttons on it. And the question mark is the one where you can type in a question. If you want to join us on stage, bearded or not, um, just, just click the raised hand. And this is one from our friend at Valparaiso University, um, Ed Finn. Uh, and Ed asks, do you feel there's a misconception that it is either lecture or the guy on the side mentality? It sounds like what you're describing is a faculty member as an active participant. And I, I, I think you've been talking to, the, to that uh, pretty well. Yeah, I mean, I think you should take this. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's, I think that we tend to view it as this binary, right? Either either you are the sage on the stage or you're the guide on the side. But I think that um, the instructors that we feature really showcase that, that there is a, a healthy balance between those things, right? Uh, in, in our lecturing chapter, we end with a metaphor from one of our um, instructors that compares this to going down a stream. Right. And, and the lecturer is kind of steering students down the stream. But there are these kind of strategic island stops along the stream that that that, you know, students disembark um, the lecturer's boat. They get onto the island. They, they try something out. They apply something. They have a discussion um, and then they get kind of back on. On, on the boat, right, to, in, until the next stream and so forth. So I think, you know, the book is full of metaphors like that, which I love. And we really, you know, kind of tried to tried to be colorful in, in, in how we how we went about talking about the teaching. But but I think it's a really beautiful way to think about um, what a classroom can be. Right. And uh, so I think that, that there is this kind of, uh, you know, dichotomy that's kind of set up by the field. But I think that there is a lot more, I think it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, and that folks are doing much more complicated things in their classroom oftentimes. Yeah, and I appreciate this question because I think it's right that we have set up too binary of a dichotomy between mm -hmm. the sage on the stage or the guide by the side. And the concern of many people is, but wait, I do have something that I want people to learn, right? right. Like, um, and so how do I make sure that my learning goals get met? Like, you know, I do need students to be able to do linear algebra when they, you know, uh, leave my class or, you know, whatever. And so I think part of the, um, uh, what we try to unpack in the different chapters, like in facilitating discussions, one of the big foci is how do you hit your learning goals in the context of a discussion where the students are actually, you know, the ones generating much of the content of that, right? And so we, hi we have conversations with a whole bunch of different faculty and we highlight different practices for how they make sure that it's not just a free for all, how it doesn't go off on a tangent, but you don't just get one dominating voice there. Like how can you help make sure that students are developing the knowledge and the skills that you care about, but in the context of the students also leading the learning? And that in ways comes up in every single chapter. And so, yeah, I agree. Eventually what we are, we are the leaders, we are the creators of learning spaces. And we are always engineering the content that students are engaging with, the people they're engaging it with, and what were the tasks that we're asking them to do. And so, and, and so we have a lot of control, and yet our control always has to be to create these spaces of active engagement by students with the material and with one another. Creators of learning spaces. What a great phrase for this, too. A really resonant one. Um, well, building off of that, we, we have a, a bunch of questions in, in the pipeline, and, and I, I one goes right to that. Uh, and this is, again, uh, I'm, I'm hitting up John again for this. Um, I don't see anything about assessment. Grades are still the coin of the realm for students. What does good teaching do about grade pressures? Well, one thing that I think is important is, say, to share the kinds of research that show that when students are engaged in 
more problem-based learning and more collaborative learning, in fact, their mastery does increase. And so if you are engaged in mastery-based grading of any kind, including like giving a test and saying, how many of these questions did you get right? You are more likely to have higher scores and hopefully therefore assign students higher grades if you engage in more act, uh, you know, based learning strategies. So that's one piece of this is that this is not a trade-off um, in any way. The other thing is that there's both questions about like overall grades, right? Average grades or scores mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. And then I'll also distribution of grades, right? And we know that in basically every institution and virtually every classroom, um, uh, we see inequalities in say grades and scores and rankings, et cetera. And we often see inequalities in learning and mastery that are associated with features that should not impact learning, right? I mean, it may be that engagement you know, different levels of engagement, yes, should impact learning. You know, if I'm busy playing Pokemon, you know, I'm not going to do as well. But there are questions, you know, things about, say, class background, racial and ethnic background, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. gender, whether or not we are caretakers of children or older adults in our families, whether or not, right, you know, all sorts, are, are we first generation in school? All sorts of things that are demographic features of ourselves have huge impacts on who we are in the world, but should not in fact have impacts on our potential for learning and say our potential for getting A's in a course. And there's a lot of research that shows that when we implement learning and teaching strategies that pull students into the learning and help them engage with the material in real time, that actually democratizes learning and is going to both raise everyone, that's like this physics study, also right. actually um, help uh, not fully resolve, but reduce inequalities and inequities in learning. And so then you'll get higher grades and a, and a more respectable and just distribution of grades. Fantastic. Yeah, the, the only thing that I would add there is that, um, I mean, just as our instructional moves in the classroom, uh, you know, need to be more interactive and more inclusive, I think that we, this also demands a pretty critical rethinking of traditional grading paradigms, right? And, and those, and there are alternatives to those, right? You know, we contract grading, labor-based grading. Uh, Brian, I know you've had uh, Jesse Stomel on this, mm -hmm. on this program mm -hmm. who, who does, you know, ungrading. Um, I think that too often grading and learning have kind of become conflated. And this is something that in my, I, I, I teach courses on schooling and education. And this is something that, that we really try to get under the surface of. Um, and, and you ask students, you know, if, if there is a grade attached to something, um, are you going to do the, the riskier assignment or are you going to do, are you going to stay in kind of the safe lane? And undoubtedly, oh, they all say the, the, the latter. Right. So I think that 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 demands, I mean, in, in some ways, therefore, the traditional grading scheme is sort of incompatible with some of these more active classroom uh, um, practices that we're talking about. Right. If we're really asking students to go out on a limb, to, to take a risk, to be OK with getting it wrong, um, can we necessarily stick to an age old uh, kind of antiquated system? That, that may be in many cases arbitrary and, and, and quite problematic for all the reasons that Mira just said. Here, here, excellent. Uh, I, I love this connection to uh, ungrading or at least you know, changing upgrading and rethinking it. Uh, you'll see in the chat, you have just a chorus of supporters on this. Uh, we, have, we have more questions coming in. I wanna make sure we get a chance to get to as many of them as possible before we run out of time because we only have about 10 minutes left. And this is from uh, our friend, Kenan Salonaro. Uh, and she has a quick question. Jeremy mentioned a book that included having student-led inquiry for the first and last 10 minutes of the class on something they know or something that knows them. Is that one of the books in the chat? This, this is our book. Yeah, this is, oh, okay, so, so this, you can find this in the, in the last kind of core chapter of the book, which is virtual learning. Um, there you go. 
there yeah. you go. And, and uh, if you have if sorry. you haven't seen it, by the way, on, on, no, no, no problem. Uh, on, I'm trying to help you, you know, sell books here. On, on the bottom left of the screen uh, is a kind of tan colored button, which has a link to the uh, Harvard uh, Education Press uh, copy of that. So uh, yeah. thank you. And, and just to just to add on, I know Mira mentioned this earlier. Our, the, the, I, what I think is really um, kind of unique about this book is that it really brings you directly into these instructors' classrooms. It, it builds the scene. Um, there are these kind of detailed, uh, descriptive, low inference vignettes that are then followed by these sections. Of what's happening in this instructors' classroom? Where we really pull it apart, bring in the instructors' and students' voices. Um, and, and, and uh, relate it to relevant research and classroom considerations. Um, and I think that, that that's quite different than a lot of pedagogical resources that you see at the post-secondary level, which really kind of take uh, the, the instructional moves out of context. Um, and yeah. so, you know, this is one way to, to see effective instruction in action and think about how you might implement what you see in your own instructional context. Bravo. This is this is great. Um, we have a, a other question, which is a typically deep and probing question from our good friend in the Houston area, Tom Hames. Uh, and he asks us this one, and I'm trying to anticipate how you would answer, but I think it's, it's too good for me to do it correctly. How do you teach creativity over conformity? Jeremy, you're our, you know, rethinking education, schools, and society person. You want to take right. that? <laughs> oh man. Um, well, I think that uh, I think that it's hard, and I think that one of the reasons that it's hard, um, and hopefully this isn't a non-answer, but I think that one of the reasons that it's hard is because many of us have have been, again, socialized in schooling spaces that really value conformity over creativity, um, and I think. I think to, to kind of break that, we have to do a great deal of self-reflection at every step. We mm -hmm. need to ask ourselves what kind of our goals are for every single thing that we do in the classroom. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know if this is, is, if this is a great answer, but I think, that, I think that it demands kind of moving away from uh, what we, envision stereotypically when we envision a college classroom or, or, or a secondary classroom. Um, Can I pick up? Yeah, please. Sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. Sorry, keep going. No, no, go ahead. Save so, me. So, no, I'm thinking about actually this um, example that you gave of Aliyah Alamin's classroom where, you know, she has these um, students do the teach-ins and teach each other. And you had mentioned that this was actually the enactment through the pedagogy of, in fact, some of the uh, sort of intellectual um, and methodological stances of the class as a whole. I actually think that that is what almost every really great uh, higher ed instructor does hmm. is within the classroom, they are enacting um, the, the, the creativity and the insights and the ways of thinking, the dispositions of their discipline through engaging students in sort of the learning of it and the developing of their own identity as people within that discipline. Uh, we have a colleague, Joel Mehta, uh, who along with another colleague, Sarah Fine, wrote a really wonderful book called In Search of Deep Deeper Learning. And there um, they sort of rethink the instructional triangle and they talk about how in every really great learning situation, uh, you see um, students um, developing mastery, they're exercising creativity, and they're developing an identity as a person who is that who is doing that kind of thing and capable of doing that kind of thing as a swimmer, as a mathematician, as a cell biologist, whatever. And I and I was thinking about say we have a um, portrait of Paola uh, Arlotti who is a neuroscientist. Um, and she is in her classroom inviting students to think with her about these complex questions about the brain, 
And she is in this undergraduate classroom kind of replicating the experience of being in her lab where, where people in her lab will be teasing around ideas and trying to figure out what do we know? What do we not know? What's important to know? And I think many of the classrooms actually that we feature feature that kind of bringing in of the creativity of the discipline, the reason that people are faculty are, are, are teaching this into the classroom space. Mm -hmm. I love that. Uh, that's terrific. Um, that's, that's, yes. Uh, I, I warned you, Tom's question would be a good one. Um, <laughs> and, and, and both of you took that in, in such great directions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I, thinking together is a phrase that I use with my students a lot, um, which I, I really want that to be the case. Uh, we also have a, uh, a question uh, from Jen Obando, uh, and this, so this broadens it out, it out a bit, and perhaps, Jeremy, this is one uh, for you based on your thinking about educational uh, reform. Uh, Jen asks, in my experience, helping faculty upskill in good pedagogy is often difficult if it's not prioritized by the administration, e.g. does it form part of promotion and tenure. Did you touch on how to remediate this? And by the way, up in the chat a bit, uh, someone mentioned launching a teaching and learning improvement program, which went over like an anvil. Yes, I saw that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how, uh, how do we do this? How do we do this? So I think, I don't think that the book adequately answers this. And I think that the, you know, the hierarchies of the university are certainly um, present in the book. Uh, so so on, uh, on the one hand, I think that these instructors that we feature don't view scholarship and teaching as these two discrete ap uh, activities that, that never intersect, right? Mm -hmm. I think that all of these instructors view um, students as having the capacity <laughs> to change their, change their, the, the instructor's minds about something, um, and that students' voices and insights and perspectives ultimately thread their way into scholarship. Um, so I think they, they don't necessarily view these as separate things. That said, I think, you know, a good number of the folks that we feature are considered lecturers. They're not considered tenure track. Um, yeah, right. Professors, and that's this enables them to really focus on the teaching. They're not held to these kind of the, the standards of scholarship that someone in a tenure line um, position would be. Um, so, and that's not all of them, right? But I think that uh, the the folks who kind of, I think that you, it, it is so hard to get to get um, faculty on board with some of this because there aren't necessarily the incentives there and the incentives are very much grounded in the research, especially at the research university, like, like the one that we feature. Um, I mean, I think that part of it uh, can really come from building a strong community of practice, which is something that we emphasize at the end. I think that, I think that uh, re even though the terrain is difficult, I think that people want authentic opportunities to share practice, to talk about what they're doing in the classroom, because too often the work of instructional improvement is this kind of private and isolated affair. And it shouldn't be that way. It needs to be a kind of joint enterprise. Um, so I think, sorry. No, ahead. no, no, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, that, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I would very quickly add is also it can help people understand that they will actually work less hard and feel better about what they are doing with a lot of their time. Yeah. That's in itself an incentive. Yeah. Many faculty have to teach a lot. And if we can say, look, we can make your time, your time spent doing that feel more productive and better. Yeah. That's a big incentive. Yeah. I, I, I hate, I hate to say it, but that is actually where we have to stop. And it's actually a good point to stop. Uh, because we are out of time, but uh, first of all, that was a great question. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jen, and both of you. That was a great answer. I love, uh, Mira, how we, you take us to uh, faculty doing better, feeling better, and uh, and being able to work well. Um, I think this is fantastic. And both of you, this is an important book that higher education needs to really, really take seriously. Um, how how do we find out what you're up to next? How do we how do we track you online? Where do we keep up with you all? I'm easy to, I mean, you know, uh, Harvard always does a 
good job of making sure that um, <laughs> that Harvard academics are easy to find. Google me and you'll find me. Uh, I mean, like in a way that's that's probably as easy as I can say. Um, Very good. And when when you have something to show on your ethics project, I'm really serious. Please I, let me know. We will bring you back. I will come back anytime and, and I'll put it in my calendar to ping you in the spring. Thank you. And Jeremy, how about you? Where do we keep up with you? You can Google me as well. I have a much lower profile than than uh, Mira. Uh, um, but uh, I, I will also make a plug for the Instructional Moves website. So, so the, the book is not the only place to, to find the wealth of knowledge that these, that these instructors have. Um, the website is, uh, and, and perhaps one of us can drop it in the chat, um, it's, it's really a, a repository of rich classroom um, videos, uh, instructors talking about their work, and you can follow different developments that are happening on that project directly through that website. So highly recommend checking it out. Excellent. And thank you, Mira, for putting that in the chat. Yeah. And I will say that I was just um, talking to our long-suffering colleague, Josh Bookin, about the fact that I think we should add a module on um, uh, AI uh, mm. and, and instructional mm -hmm. moves in AI. You absolutely should. Uh, in, in the chat, in fact, um, our good friend Brent Anders had a question about that. He has a book on AI literacy as well as a very active YouTube. Uh, he's the American University of Armenia, and I strongly recommend uh, checking him out. But we've done checking you out. You both have been fantastic guests. Um, this has just been heartening and practical uh, and so wise. Thank you both uh, so much for sharing so much of your knowledge for this really cool book. Thank you for having us, even though I don't have a beard. <laughs> That's okay. We'll still bring you back. Please be well, uh, Mira. Thank you again. And, uh, and take care, Jeremy. Please enjoy that awesome college. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care. And don't leave yet, friends. Uh, we have, uh, um, just to let you know, to wrap things up, uh, thank you all, by the way, for the really, really good questions. If you want to keep talking about instructional moves, you can do it on social media. Just use the hashtag FTTE, and here you can find me on Twitter, Mastodon, Threads, Blue Sky, or, or my blog. If you'd like to go back into our previous sessions and take a look at our sessions on teaching and improving teaching, just go to this archive, tinyurl.com slash ftfarchive. We have sessions coming up on other higher education topics, on anti-racism, mental health, and we have a community gathering coming up. Just go to the Future Trends Forum at forum.futureofeducation.us. Thank you again all for being with us. Uh, it's great, as we just said, thinking with you. Hope you're all well. Take care, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>